How are we all doing? Good. Good? It's good to hear. All right, well, uh, today we will continue discussing uh, multiple linear regression. So um, we'll start off by talking about fitting a polynomial model. So polynomial models are still considered uh, linear regression because even though you have, you know, quadratic or, you know, cubic terms or whatever, uh, everything is linearly related to y. If you just replace um, x squared with, you know, x sub 2 or, you know, the letter y or the letter, I mean, not letter y, some other variable, variable z or whatever, uh, we're all linearly related. Okay, so um, to talk about the polynomial model, we're going to look at some professor salary data and see how it relates to years of experience. Okay, so this is um, this data comes from our textbook, and if we uh, we load it, we see uh, we have salary and we have experience, and what we want to know, we want to try to create a prediction for the salary of the professor, and I, so this is like in thousands of dollars, and this is uh, years of experience. So I'm not sure when this was taken, uh, this data was taken, but um, and the idea being if uh, you know, how, how is salary related to experience? So if we graph the data, this is, this is how it appears, okay? So it appears that, at least for the first however many years, um, as your experience increases, so does your salary. But then at a certain time, more experience, we see, uh, the salaries go down. So what do you think is going on here? Decrease of productivity. Decrease? So I, would, I wouldn't say that people are, I think these people just got hired on earlier. And so like, you know, they didn't keep asking <laughs> for raises or something. I don't know. You know, I don't know what happens. Or maybe, yeah, maybe as a, or, yeah, it could be decrease in productivity in that as uh, they had more and more experience, they got maybe got put on emeritus status. I mean, this is, te you know, this is close to 40 years, right? So if you're like, if you start off a professor around, let's say, 30 or something, around this time, you're close to 40 years old. So maybe, I mean, not 40, you're like 70 years old. So maybe you're just not teaching as much. Maybe you have a lighter workload, so maybe your salary goes down. Who knows, okay? Whatever we're seeing, we're seeing a not linear relationship, right? Um, so we clearly don't want to fit a, a linear model to this. So we're going to, um, we're going to fit it with a quadratic term. So we have salary uh, as explained by experience and experience squared, okay? Using this I notation to explain that this is another separate variable, All right? And then to, to plot it, uh, we're plotting professor, uh, the experience, and, uh, and salary. So this, is, this just puts the dots on the board, OK? And then we are creating a new data frame here. Uh, and so here, this is just um, a sequence from 0 to 37, which is kind of uh, the fewest years of experience to the maximum years of experience. And we're taking this, this experience new, and we're creating a data frame called experience equal to this. And using that data, we feed it into uh, the predict function. So the predict function basically just fits the, uh, the model Okay, fits uh, this into our, our model. Is that okay that I just all have it all in one line here? Okay, so this is this is a sequence from zero to thirty-seven. We fit that. We put that into the function predict, which calls for the model and 
the values that you want to make predictions for. So we're saying make predictions for 0, make predictions for 1, make prediction for 37. Okay? And so that result gets fed into the function experience new, I mean into the lines function, which just plots a line connecting these points. So experience new again is the sequence from 0 to 37, and these are now the fitted values. So this thing, so it's just we're creating a line connecting um, the fitted values together with a line. Okay, so this, that seems reasonable. We can do the same thing uh, with ggplot. So, you know, fitting all of this stuff, um, there's no easy method in R to just fit polynomial lines. AB line is easy, right? With a linear line, you just do AB line of the model, boom, it fits the, um, the fitted least squares line, but with a polynomial model, you got to kind of create um, the grid. Okay, so ggplot2, we get the same thing. All right, so here I'm creating the data frame of predicted values. So here I'm just taking the sequence from uh, the min to the max, so this is uh, experience, okay? And then again, we're just taking that thing and we're uh, creating a data frame here. So, so here I'm just creating a data frame between experience and salary of, you know, of our predicted values. All right, so, uh, so we just create a sequence from the min to the max. I didn't have to do that. I could have just done sequence 0 to 37 length out 37 as well. Um, and then, uh, and we're again using the predict function to find our fitted values. So we have, and then we are basically C binding them, but we don't C bind when we have a data frame, right? C bind is only for matrices. So if you want to add a column to a data frame, you just use the function data frame. So we're just taking our current data frame predicted which just it contains the experience column and then we're sticking on another column salary so this predicted how many uh, columns and rows does it have two columns the columns are experience and salary. How many rows? 50, because experience is a sequence from 0 to 37, but 50, 50 of them. Okay. All right, and then so for ggplot, um, well, this we could have done this anyway. Uh, so we're going to do ggplot. And so this just puts the dots on there. Professor salary, uh, we're x is experience and y is salary, and we're adding the points, okay? And then to this plot, we're adding another layer, which is a line, and we're using our predicted line. And then we get the same thing, okay? So it's basically just the, the exact same graph, but just whether you want to use ggplot or not. Okay, um, and then so now that we have our fitted line, we can look at our standardized residuals. So if we're using just the base functions, um, we can get the standardized residuals by calling R standard. And then we can plot this with uh, experience versus the standardized residuals. So X versus our standardized residuals. This seems reasonable. No, no crazy patterns here. We can... Uh, Label these as such. ggplot, we do the same thing. We call fortify our model. Uh, so fortify creates a new data frame with a whole bunch of like summary statistics, right? And so um, we are going to compare our original x variable experience and then just plot it against the standardized residuals and we want to add the points layer. So 
whether it's uh, the regular or ggplot. No pattern in our standardized residuals, so this seems like a good, a good thing. Okay. We can uh, take a look at leverage. All right. So uh, using just the base functions, we get leverage by calling the function hat values. All right, the leverage is uh, basically the, uh, the diagonals of our hat matrix. What's the hat matrix? It's the uh, x transpose x, x, uh, transpose y, well, without the y, because it's, it's the thing that you multiply by y to get one, go from y to y hat. Okay, so that's our, uh, our hat matrix and that's our, our leverage values, okay? And then so, you know, if this is just um, kind of the rule of thumb that says you do six divided by um, the number of points you have, and that's kind of the cutoff between high leverage and low leverage. Uh, and we see, you know, the points in the extreme, these are the ones that produce the, uh, the most leverage, which kind of makes sense. Um, points that are farther away from the center will have more leverage. Okay. Same thing with ggplot. Um, we fortify our model, and then the leverage values are the hat values, okay? We graph the points, and if we want this horizontal line here, uh, you do geom the geometry you want is a horizontal line where the intercept is 6 over the number of points. Okay, so what we see is the three smallest values, the two highest values are over this cutoff value, I mean, this one's really close. So basically, the smallest x and the largest x have the, uh, the most leverage. Okay, and then if we just look at our general diagnostic plots, this seems okay. So if we look at scale location, we don't see any indication of um, our uh, residuals experiencing non-constant variance. So this looks pretty, uh, pretty good. This doesn't look exactly straight. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know um, what we can do. But, and over here, we don't see anything with crazy Cook's distance in our uh, residuals versus leverage uh, is between negative two and two, which pretty uh, pretty good. Okay, and again, residuals versus fitted isn't so great because we can't, um, we have no basis to judge whether negative four or four is big. But standardized residuals are better. Yes? What are the red line mean? The red line? Which one? Yeah, all, all of them. All of them. Okay, so it's kind of, this is like fitting, um, it's almost like fitting another regression model to these dots of themselves. Okay? Um, we're not fitting a linear model. It's like a low S, I think, localized um, regression model. So that's why there's a little bit of curvature. But basically, um, for all of these things, residuals versus fitted, you want something close to a flat line. Scale location, you want something close to a flat line. Residuals versus leverage, you want something close to a flat line. Which in this case, it kind of checks, passes our visual inspection. Okay, if you see uh, an angle for the red line here, you know, going like this, then you have evidence of non-constant variance. If you see a pattern in our line here, then it means maybe there's a pattern in your residuals, which, which we don't want. Okay, and so based on that, we can take a look at the summary of our model and see um, if we can make any kind of inference here. So the intercept is 34.7, so this would be our prediction for salaries of a professor with no experience. Uh, and then as uh, experience increases, the slope associated with that is this, but then we're also apparently subtracting off a little bit based on experience squared. 
Uh, and so all of these are significant. It is a little bit um, difficult to have an easy to interpret, um, easy to interpret, uh, I guess, yeah, meaning from these coefficients. Uh, but we can uh, we can use it to make um, good predictions, as uh, as this line seems to indicate, and we can create you know prediction intervals if we if we wanted, um, go up or down or just using um, the built-in inference tools because we're assuming um, the model assumes constant variance. Uh, we can just use the predict tool here. And we can create a confidence interval with the lower and upper bounds and the, uh, the estimated fit. So this is someone with 10 years experience. We're estimating 58 with a lower bound of 52.5 and, and an upper bound of 63.7, which I guess seems, seems reasonable given the, uh, the data that we see. You know, if we flip back um, some of the pictures, 10 years experience, that seems about right. Okay, so even though we don't have a whole lot of data in this section, it seems to make sense. Okay, so that's polynomial, um, polynomial regression, which, uh, which I think is, is, very, uh, is rather straightforward and easy to understand. You had a, a little bit of uh, some work with that on your, um, the homework that you turned in last time. And again, the thing about polynomial regression is it assumes constant variance. So if you create a prediction interval, it would have the same, same width throughout the, um, throughout the line. Okay. Um, so next week we'll get into all of the diagnostics onto you know whether this is good or bad. Um, Any, it, it's, uh, it's good. All right, let's talk about uh, ANOVA in multiple linear regression. So ANOVA, the uh, general concept ANOVA still holds true, which is total variation or sum of squares total, SST, is broken out into two parts. The variation explained by the model, or SS regression, and the unexplained variation, which is our residual sum of squares. So these are the two big parts in um, ANOVA. We're just breaking it into how much of the total variation can be explained by the model, how much is unexplained. And so um, if you recall, sum of squares total is just the difference between each individual value y and uh, just the mean value of y. Okay, so it's kind of the numerator of the variance term and sum of squares total. And then the re uh, residual sum of squares is the difference between our predicted values, the y hat values, and each individual y squared. And then the regression is the difference between our prediction and the mean, which would be our, basically our prediction if we had no other information to improve our prediction, right? So I think this, this should all be review, but it's good to just refresh your memory in case, uh, in case you have forgotten. Okay, and so if you recall, with a simple linear regression, the R squared value is basically uh, residual sum of squares over sum of squares total. This is basically the proportion that is unexplained. So the R squared is the proportion that is explained, right? One minus the proportion that's unexplained gives us R squared, which is the proportion of the variance that is explained. Uh, this, this value can also hold true for multiple linear regression. But the thing is, is that as you just add more variables into your model, you're going to always be able to explain just a tiny bit more of the, um, the model, okay? You, you know, you can overfit in that you're just throwing in all of these other predictor variables and it's going to incre increase your R squared value a tiny bit. So to kind of adjust for that, we have the R squared adjusted, which divides uh, the residual sum of squares by um, n minus the number of predictors. 
so that if you are uh, increasing the, uh, the number of predictors, uh, it, it affects this, okay? So this is, uh, yeah, the number of predictor variables in there over the, uh, the sum of scores total. Uh, if you recall our F table, or not the F table, the uh, ANOVA table, okay, this is exactly the same that we had for linear sum of square, or linear, sorry, simple linear regression, simple linear regression, um, except the only thing that has changed now is our degrees of freedom is P, meaning um, one for every predictor variable. So for Simple linear, simple linear regression, our degrees of freedom for the sum of squares regression is 1. Over here, it's now p. Okay. So this is still uh, the sum of squares terms that we had uh, earlier, as they've always been. And our f ratio is the ratio between the mean squares. Mean squares is always sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. I'm hoping this table is familiar and, and, and feeling okay. All right, and so we can take check the statistical significance or basically just could uh, our results have been random or is there actually something to our regression model? And this is just uh, by looking at the F ratio, which this thing here is exactly mean squares, right? Sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. So no, no mystery here. Okay, And so this tests if all of the x variables combined make a significant difference in predicting y. All right. And so usually, as you know, if you have one thing in here that's significant and you know, 10 other things that are not significant, all of them combined will be significant. Okay, So um, so this, this just tests if all of them are, all of them combined, okay? So if, if, if one of them is significant, this F will, will prove significant. The only time this F will be insignificant is if all of your variables are basically independent of Y. So if all of your predictors have nothing to do with Y or Y is independent of everything, then this, this thing will come out insignificant. But otherwise, if, if just one of them is significant, this thing will become significant. Maybe I should make that a little bit more explicit. Okay. Uh, usually, though, we want to know, you know, if we've got like 10 predictors or four predictors or however many predictors you have, usually you want to know which predictors are important. Okay. And we want to we want a way to pick out the uh, the important ones. And so this can be done uh, basically with what we call partial f-tests. And we're, when we do a partial f-test, we're essentially comparing the, uh, the sum of squares of the regression model with all of them versus the sum of squares of the regression model with just the, uh, the variables that we're interested in. Okay? And we compare the, um, the sum of squares of the regression between the complete model and the reduced model and we throw it into an f-test to see if there is a significant difference between the complete and the re reduced model. Um, there is some, it's, it's not a clear-cut process. It's not just like do this and this will give you the perfect number of predictors to use. Uh, and that's because a lot of times the different predictors are um, are related to each other, right? So we might want to know what things influence um, academic performance in children around the United States, okay? And we might look at um, income and race and uh, education of the parents and uh, a lot of these things, and what we're going to find is probably each of these by themselves are going to be very uh, have an influence on 
the educational um, level of the children or the academic performance of children. But, you know, education level of parents is often highly correlated with income of the parents or income of the household. And so if you include one, that might make the other one insignificant or, you know, and vice versa. So which one do you include? This is, um, this is a hard question to answer, okay? Uh, we're going to explore it a little bit more thoroughly later on in the course. Uh, but you can have two people look at the same data and pick different predictors, okay? And, and have a completely valid model uh, with different predictors. So, it, you know, I keep saying this, that regression isn't uh, very clear cut. And, and this is one of those cases where one of those times where it really isn't uh, entirely clear which predictor variables you should use. Um, we're going to just look at a simple data set of restaurant data from New York. And it's pretty, um, pre pretty easy to deal with in, in this data set. Um, but in other cases, yeah, not not so clear, okay? Uh, so yeah, you've got forward stepwise, backward stepwise, you know, all of these different ways to pick out the, uh, the predictors. Okay, so our New York City restaurant data, we're looking at 168 Italian restaurants in New York City, I think that were rated by Zagat, Zagat, and um, we have, uh, what we wanna know is what is related to the price of a dinner, okay? And so this is just uh, one entree plus a drink and a tip. And we record, you know, we rounded them off to kind of the nearest dollar. You know, I don't know how they decided which entree, right? Like, are you just getting the spaghetti with marinara? Or are you getting the, um, I don't know, what's the fanciest thing you can get in an Italian restaurant? Veal. The veal, uh, veal parmesan or something. Um, with lobster tails. I don't know, do they do lobster in Italian? Right? Every fancy restaurant does that, right? Okay, um, but we're looking at um, customer rating of the food. So they must have had some, there must have been some standardized thing like a chicken parmesan or something that's like your, I don't know, go-to standard at the Italian restaurant. I have no idea. Um, plus a drink and a tip. Um, so we looked at, you know, the the rating of the food, which is on a scale of 1 to 30, you know, the decor, uh, 1 to 30, and the service, 1 to 30. Um, so these we can compare. And then east is a, a dummy variable for whether the uh, restaurant is east or west of Fifth Avenue in, uh, in New York, which is like uh, apparently it segregates a nicer versus not as nice part of Manhattan, but I mean, we're talking Manhattan, New York, which is like the uh, the fancy part, right? Um, fancy part of New York. Okay, and so um, so we're gonna just fit all of everything together. Okay, so we have an intercept and then one for each of our uh, our things. Okay, so x four is a dummy variable, so it's a zero or one. Okay, and then we have a constant error, error term here. Okay, so to do this, we load up our, uh, our data from, uh, from our data set. I don't, I don't remember when this data came, but you know, I, I just wanted to see, are these still on um, in existence? And they are, so, um, but yeah. So 43 bucks for chicken parmesan and a drink and a tip at Daniela Restaurante which would be what? Is that triple dollar on Yelp? Who knows? Yeah, triple. triple. Triple's over $30 per person, kind of. Okay, so we got this, and, uh, and let's just see what happens. Okay, so we're gonna fit our linear model. This is model one. Price as explained by food, plus decor, plus service, plus east. And here's our summary, okay? And it says, boom. So our intercept, negative 24, 
which uh, has no practical interpretation because no restaurant's going to give you um, $24 back for walking in. If you say you got no food or decor, <laughs> I don't know how this works. Okay. Um, and so, you know, based on the food rating, how does it change, you know, based on the decor rating, which, um, you know, that, that affects it. Service doesn't seem to uh, affect it very much. You know, if we look at these stars, this is kind of our evaluation of whether something's significant or not. So East is significant at the 5% uh, level, whereas these are significant at the um, 1 1,000th level. So these are very significant. We can also look at the T value and see uh, decor is more significant than food. Okay, so just looking at the, uh, the coefficients, uh, we see that uh, decor seems to have the highest impact on the price of the food. So if your decor rating goes up one, then you can charge an extra two bucks for, your, for the meal. Okay, so I don't, I don't know how the decor is rated. Apparently, just the customers give it a rating from zero to thirty, and you know, I don't, I don't know what a thirty out of thirty decor restaurant looks like versus a one out of thirty. You know, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Hole in the wall restaurant, I guess, would have a low, and then if it's very fancy with a maitre d. What, do they still call them maitre d's in uh, an Italian restaurant? Is it something else? What is that? That's like the host, but he'll wear a tux if it's fancy. <laughs> Just the host or hostess. Okay, and service is pretty much zero here, right? And in fact, it looks negative, meaning <laughs> as the service goes down, maybe, or up, your the price uh, it seems to have zero. But if we look at um, the pairs, you know, so if we just kind of create this um, scatter plot matrix, okay, you know, price versus food, price versus decor, price versus service, they all seem to be positively related. Even service, which has um, a zero, zero thing. And I think it's probably because everything is kind of correlated with themselves, with each other. So, you know, service is correlated with decor and food and price, but I guess in individually, once you include everything else, it's no longer significant. It's, it's hard to say, it's hard to say. And this is with the, uh, the pairs function. Pairwise scatter plot. Uh, we can print uh, the ANOVA table itself, which breaks out each um, individual component, okay, seeing whether it's significant or not, and, uh, and this kind of reflects the same uh, results that we saw in our uh, summary table for the coefficients. And so because service is not very significant here or in our... Um, in our coefficients table, to, you know, this is doing a, a t-test. Uh, this is very insignificant. Uh, we're going to try removing it. Okay, so we removed it. We just said food, decor, and whether it's east or not. And so now we uh, we do the summary here. And so here, looks like everything is significant. Um, and so, oops, what happened here? Oh, I didn't coefficients M1 here. The, uh, let me pull this up here. So, uh, where is the summary? So if we look at our R squared term, this is with, oh no, no, that's the wrong one. So model one. So with everything, our adjusted R squared is around 0 0.6187. And then if we take out uh, service,
our uh, adjusted R squared actually goes up to uh, 0 0.62. Um, when you add or subtract variables, sometimes the adjusted R squared stays in the same range. Sometimes it spikes up or jumps down um, quite a bit. That's not necessarily an indication of the importance of that one variable, just kind of uh, you have to think of adjusted R squared as, you know, what, what can be explained by the model and adding or subtracting variables will affect that, um, sometimes a lot, sometimes less. Um, usually, if it's not an important variable, it will not have a major impact, and usually if it is an important variable, this will, it will affect this. Uh, but occasionally, things don't behave the way you expect them uh, to do, behave. And this needs to be M2. Question? Yes? So, you, you need service because it could vary, or the coefficient can very well be zero? Yeah, so over here, this we're just testing, we're doing a t-test to see if service is significantly different from zero and our p-value is coming out 0.99, which means, uh, no, it's not significantly different from zero. So we, we took it out, okay? Because uh, according to uh, the analysis, it, it wasn't important. So we, uh, we took it out, and then we, we redid it. And if we look at the uh, coefficients for food, decor, and east, we see they're all kind of, they seem to be unaffected with the addition or subtraction of the service term. Yeah. So at the very bottom, there's a p-value, right? Uh-huh. So this is the p-value of everything combined together. Okay. So it turns out it's pretty much the same. Oh, um, so our f statistic, because now we only have three degrees of freedom, this actually becomes even even greater um, over here. But this is this would be the um, the not there. But in our ANOVA table. This one, okay? So that p-value at the very bottom of the summary, which gets cut off in these slides, the p-value at the very bottom is basically uh, the p-value associated with this f-statistic of everything together. So what does the null hypothesis look like for this? Yeah, you know, I, I probably should throw that in there. The null hypothesis, where am I? So the null hypothesis for everything would be um, that all of the betas, beta underscore zero is the same as beta underscore one, which is the same as beta underscore two. Uh, and all of them, beta underscore p, that they're all equal to zero. That all of your betas are insignificant. So your null hypothesis would be this. And the alternative uh, at least one of the betas is not zero. Okay, so the, the null hypothesis for the entire model is that all of your beta terms are zero, and then the alternative is at least one of the betas are not zero. Okay, but it's um, but the alternative does not specify which beta is not zero. So you kind of have to do this this piecewise thing, and uh, that's just a tiny bit unfortunate, but that's how, that's how it goes. Okay. All right, so. Uh, I'm sorry? The R squared? The R squared is, uh, let's, let's see. So the R squared is still um, uh, the multiple R squared or the adjusted R squared? Both of them. Okay, 
So both of them are kind of a, a measure of how much of the variance, total variance, is explained by the model. Okay, so it's a it's a measure of how much of the total variance is explained by the model. The multiple r squared is just kind of your your standard one, and the adjusted one takes into account the number of predictors that are being used. And so uh, the adjusted r squared is almost always going to be a little bit smaller than the uh, the multiple r squared, which uh, which takes everything uh, into a into account, okay? And so, um, okay, so we see that the multiple R squared term for the complete model is 0 0.6279, and, point, uh, and for the reduced model is also 0 0.6279. If we take it out to mo more decimal places, we're gonna probably find some difference here. This adjusted R squared is reduced is actually smaller than it is down here because the adjusted r squared takes into account how many predictors we have and so we have four predictors and that reduces this a tiny bit whereas over here we only have three predictors so this goes up uh, a tiny bit okay so it, it's still just the idea of how much of the total variance can be explained by the model um, it's not it's not the end-all be-all, and that's not the way we should completely evaluate our things, but it's, uh, it gives us a good idea of how, how well our model is able to predict um, prices. Okay, so just so taking into food decor and whether it's east or west, uh, Fifth Avenue explains about 62, 63% of the, uh, the variance uh, variance in price, okay, 62% of the variance in price. Uh, so that means about 38% of the variance in price comes from other things. So that might be brand reputation or, you know, Yelp reviews or whatever it might be, okay? Or actually, no, uh, food is kind of like a food decor. It are kind of like Yelp reviews. So just, just other things, maybe, who knows, celebrity chef name or something, right? Um, how long they've been around, what, whatever. What makes an, what separates an expensive restaurant from a, a cheap one? The food, yeah. So I guess it, it doesn't, you know, the food is a, a rating on zero to 30 of whether it's tasty or not, but you know, we've all been to cheap restaurants that have really tasty food and, and things like that, so it's, you know, it's whether they pour truffle oil on your fries or not, right? Um, I think there's the truffle truffle oil mac and cheese, which is like mac and cheese with a hundred dollars of truffles shaved or oil poured on whatever. Okay. Um, analysis of covariance. Okay, so uh, we're gonna run out of time for this stuff, uh, so we'll talk about it on Friday. Um, but we can take a closer look at the uh, dummy variable east and see what effect it has on our price, okay? And <clears throat> there are a few possibilities. One is that it has no effect on y. And another is that it has a constant effect or an effect on the slope or an effect on both the slope and intercept. And and, uh, and the book calls this, you know, parallel lines um, intersecting at the intercept, but divergent. And this is like what it calls unrelated lines here. Okay. So in, if we apply this to just kind of the uh, linear model where the base model is B0, 1, X, and E, if it has a constant effect on Y, when the dummy variable is zero, it's just our base linear regression line, and when it is uh, 1, we're just adding a constant term, b2. When we, um, if it changes the slope, where uh, we, have, we add this b3d times x term, so when it's 0, it's the same as our regular old simple linear regression. When it's 1, our slope is now the combination of b1 plus b3. But we have the same intercept. Okay, and so this is just applied to... Uh, 
simple linear regression, but the concept expands to uh, multiple linear regression, same thing. Uh, we can see if it changes the slope and our intercept. And in that case, when it's zero, it's the original line. And when the dummy variable is one, we're adding a constant here and we're changing the slope of the, uh, the x term. Okay, so what does this look like? If we uh, look at our New York City restaurants model, okay, somebody might say, hey, all of this stuff about food decor and service, okay, it actually affects things differently based on whether the restaurant is east or west of uh, 5th Street. Somebody could take that argument, right? And basically, that means, you know, east of Manhattan, or east of 5th Street, the food is really important, and so you have this uh, coefficient, but on the west side of 5th Street, the food is, you know, has a different importance, okay? And so we have these basically interactive terms, interaction terms be for food when it's affected uh, when east is on or off, okay? So we have the, the effect of decor uh, that depends on east and the effect of service when it's uh, east or not, okay? So this is kind of the base, how food affects it by itself and decor and service affect it by itself. And then also, do we ha also have to make an adjustment for food when it's east or west? Do we have to make an adjustment for decor when it's east or west? we have to make an adjustment for service when it's east or west. Okay, and so this is like a full model here. And, uh, and we can just look at the results. So let me, actually it's probably better if I look at this directly in our studio rather than um, than here. Okay, so adding all of this stuff, okay, um, we see <laughs> it, it just makes everything a little bit, so decor is still very important, okay, and then whether we are east or not, the decor is no longer significant, and so what this says is that when we're east, we adjust our decor by minus two, or we increase it by plus two. It seems that east or west, it does, could have a larger impact on uh, how important the food is, but here we're not, we're still not significant, so it's hard to say, okay? And overall, um, you know, our, our terms are now becoming uh, less significant in of themselves individually. So adding all of these things seemed to have weakened the case for any one of these things individually. Overall, we're still, we're, uh, you know, our multiple R squared is still, you know, it goes up now that we've added more things. The adjusted R squared is uh, around the same, okay? And it's, uh, it's let's see, our F statistic, um, is on seven degrees of freedom. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to say, but basically none of, these, none of these interaction terms about food having a significant impact, whether it's east or west or decor or service, east or west, are in of themselves significant. They, some of them are kind of, but not really, okay? It's like a one in eight chance that it could just happen by just because of the random nature of our sampling. So perhaps if we had even more data or something, or if there really was an effect, we would see something here. But uh, right here, adding all of these extra terms don't, doesn't produce anything, um, any of these interaction ones being actually significant here. Okay. Um, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in uh, greater detail on Friday. As, uh, as we uh, continue our stuff on multiple linear regression here. Okay, so we'll end there for now, and, uh, and we'll see you guys. Um, so I know I haven't posted the homework. I'm still trying to figure out 
what a good homework assignment would be. So I'll, I'll make sure that, you know, when I post the homework, you will have uh, an appropriate amount of time to complete it, okay? So, um, so right now, just take it easy, I guess.